Okay, so um, this is the first Saturday night after the ending of our three-month winter retreat. We have our first overnight guest of the season. Karina's here for the weekend. Well, I'm not sure exactly uh, why this came up in my mind, but um, for some reason, uh, uh, a movie that I saw, the, the, the last movie that I saw before becoming a monk um, uh, came to my mind. Um, it was, I don't know, maybe a, a few weeks before we opened up uh, Abhayagiri, before I took my Anagarka ordination. And uh, uh, a friend of ours, uh, a long-term friend of the Sangha, Jeannie Bendick, uh, took me to see my last movie, uh, or my last, at least, movie in a movie theater, anyway. Um, and it was a movie uh, called Dead Man Walking. And I don't know, many, maybe some people know of it or not. This was must have been 90, 96, I guess, huh? 1996. And it was based on a book, which I actually never read. But um, uh, it was a movie uh, about uh, a man who was on death row uh, leading up to his execution, just before his execution, uh, uh, for uh, committing a you know, pretty horrible uh, crime of sexual assault and murder um, with a couple of teenagers. Um, and he was, obviously, he was on, he was on death row and, and uh, facing his execution. And, uh, a spiritual advisor uh, was called in to, as they do, um, uh, for people on death row, uh, for people who want a spiritual advisor, call them in like Lung Pa did with Jay Siripong. Um, and this particular person was a Catholic nun uh, who was called in to uh, be with this person at council uh, through the process of execution. And it's a many, there were many layers to it, uh, many layers to the actual story itself, the, the primary one being sort of a tale of, uh, of uh, redemption uh, in that uh, the man who uh, was convicted uh, of the crimes uh, and was facing death worked through his uh, absolute denial of any responsibility uh, for the crime um, to the point of uh, shortly before the execution, uh, this Catholic nun, uh, extremely skilled and compassionate and caring, uh, was able to uh, get him to open up to the truth of uh, the fact that he did commit these crimes and that you know, the freedom or the, the you know, redemption, in a sense, um, for those crimes, uh, you know, was apparent to some degree. Um, of course, you know, from the Buddhist standpoint, we, we don't know what the effect of those actions uh, were, you know, what the destination or the result was, but uh, at least there was this opening uh, to truth at the last, last minute. But that, uh, it wasn't so much that particular aspect of the, of the story that was coming up for me as was uh, kind of a subplot with the family members, the, the parents of the two teenagers, uh, uh, husband and two sets of uh, two pairs, husband and wife, uh, who were, one was the parent, parent one set was the parents of the, the, uh, the teenage boy and one was the, uh, a set of parents of the teenage girl uh, that were uh, both who were her, who were murdered, and their story of coming to terms um, with the violent death of their their two beloved children, and how part of that story was their uh, complete conviction. Um, that the execution would serve justice uh, and that um, 
that in some way it would uh, atone, not atone, but sort of, uh, I'm not sure what, I can't remember, I can't think of the word I'm trying to think of, but would, uh, would uh, pay off the debt in a sense, or would equal the, equal the uh, stage. Um, uh, and somehow uh, you know, the, the tit for tat, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, kind of response, death for death, uh, would somehow um, make everything okay, would even the, even the uh, uh, circumstances. And how after the execution, um, how it, they kind of followed, uh, the movie kind of followed the, uh, uh, the parents uh, afterwards and how it showed essentially that that kind of relief uh, never happened, that it didn't solve the problem, it didn't make the bad memories go away, it didn't bring their children back, um, and uh, how it essentially didn't get resolved for those, for those people. The execution didn't resolve it. Um, and also kind of the, the slow attempt to come to terms with that, that one of the parents had the, the father of one of the, the children uh, and still working with this Catholic nun uh, and how she tried to counsel him to come to uh, greater acceptance of, of what had happened. So I guess for some reason that was coming up in my mind in this sense of um, uh, and this is a very, of course, very s extreme example of uh, how we think that fixing something uh, in an external way, um, uh, getting rid of essentially what we think is the cause of our problems, trying to annihilate the cause of our grief, of our difficulty, of our pain, um, that somehow if we can just end, uh, end the, end the uh, cause, in this case, end the life of, of the perpetrator, um, but uh, as an example of how we all try to get rid of and annihilate and control um, what it is that we think is uh, causing us uh, suffering. And this uh, belief that we have or should have uh, that kind of control over the world around us and the world of our experience, externally and internally. Uh, and we act on that uh, sense that uh, we should have uh, control. So it just brought to mind the whole issue of control in the, in the Buddhist teachings, uh, and it's a um, a topic or a, a, a point that comes up uh, in, in a number of different ways. Well, what do we have control over and what do we not have control over? Uh, and how that sense of, um, that false sense of control uh, or that wish for control is what forms the basis for this sense of self. And how really exploring that and realizing that on many different levels, um, that uh, we don't have uh, ultimate control and we don't have a lot of control over many things and we have a modicum of control over some things uh, and how important it is to learn what it is that we have control over and what we don't have control over because that conditions uh, how we respond. If we don't have control over something, will respond to a difficult circumstance in one way. And if we do have some control over something, then that will condition a different kind of response. You know, uh, oftentimes um, you might hear different teachers talk about their particular uh, approaches to dealing with uh, painful uh, circumstances. Uh, uh, physical or mental, more often in, in the mental realm, uh, in that, like if uh, sometimes you hear uh, teachers say, 
well, painful mental experience comes uh, in, in, into your life, um, bad habits or negative uh, mind states, um, that the appropriate response is to uh, allow them there, uh, be with them, uh, don't push them away, don't turn away from them, uh, and just to see if you can experience them um, fully for what they are without resistance. And sometimes, you know, other teachers might say, you know, negative mind states come up, uh, don't get involved with them, don't allow them to, you know, uh, take uh, any hold whatsoever, don't pay attention to them, shift your attention to something more skillful than a, a negative mind state. Immediately, uh, don't attend to that and shift your attention to something that's more positive or more skillful. Um, and I've had people ask me that question. It's sort of like, okay, well, I hear so and so say this, and so and so say that. Well, you know, what's the appropriate response? How do I deal with that? And in my mind, it's a bit more nuanced than either one or the other. Uh, and uh, either one or both uh, can be an appropriate response depending on the particular circumstance. And that often, not always, but often uh, is differentiated by whether how much control we have uh, in a particular circumstance or what it is that, that uh, we think we might or might not have control over uh, will help condition which approach or what kind of approach to take with dealing with these uh, difficult mental states. The, uh, uh, there's a kind of a general teaching that uh, the, uh, the Buddha uh, put forth, taught, uh, that goes to some extent to explain a bit of, of this sense of, of control. Um, uh, it's in the Pali, it's itapachayata. Uh, Ajahn Jeff translates it or, or uh, refers to it as this, that conditionality. And it's a very short four-line um, uh, comment or four-line teaching uh, that yeah. needs a little bit of uh, explanation because it's not immediately obvious and uh, right off the top, but it goes something like, uh, like this. It's uh, when this is, that is. With the arising of this comes the arising of that. When this isn't, that isn't. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. So it might sound a little cryptic, but um, Ajahn Jeff, again, has a, a really good um, way of talking about it, at least in my mind, very, very useful. Uh, and it, it gets a little bit conceptual, maybe a little bit abstract, but I think it's really useful abstraction to keep in mind uh, when we're talking about the uh, comma and control. Um, so he, he kind of divides up the, those four lines into two pairs, one, one he calls uh, the synchronic and one he calls the linear. Uh, and the first and the third lines, when this is, that is, and when this isn't, that isn't, is what he refers to as the syn synchronic. And the other two, uh, the other pair, the other two lines, the second and the fourth of uh, uh, with the arising of this comes the arising of that, and with the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. He calls, he calls the linear uh, part of, of this uh, teaching. So the, like the, you know, the synchronic, when this is, that is, when this isn't, that isn't, you know, basically refers to this uh, moment, this present moment experience um, of certain conditions that arise in line with each other at the same time. Um, and that the second pair, uh, with the arising of this comes the arising of that, with the cessation of this comes the cessation of that, refers to events over time, so more of a linear uh, kind of a, a thing. So that it's a way of explaining the law of kama uh, in that um, our experience in the moment is partially due, anyway, to the law of kama. Things uh, mental patterns uh, or mental programs that we have put into uh, 
action uh, in the past, various habitual ways of uh, responding to certain circumstances, uh, actions that we take, body, speech, or mind, uh, have a, uh, a, that's comma, we're making comma when they're volitional actions. And they'll have a result. Uh, all volitional actions have some sort of result. And our present moment experience, uh, it's a combination of many factors, um, circumstance, biology, natural laws, uh, but also with uh, the influence of comma from past actions, so that what we're experiencing right here and now um, uh, is something that's been set in motion uh, and goes along certain patterns in our uh, ways of responding and experiencing the world. Uh, these patterns um, you know, condition how an event uh, is experienced, uh, the results of an event. So we don't have a lot of control in that one moment of the experience of past, uh, past action. Uh, it's, the motion has uh, happened, uh, the intention has happened, and the results will be experienced in some way or another. And, very hard to know exactly how they will be experienced, but uh, uh, the motion is there and, and the uh, present moment experience is a result. So this is vipaka, result from kama action. Uh, and there's not a lot of control over that, and knowing that is useful. Um, so our patterns that have been conditioned in us, the patterns of how we see the world, how we experience the world, the mental, uh, the colors through which we uh, experience uh, the events in our mind, um, tendencies towards, uh, say, uh, attachment or uh, uh, sensual desire or tendencies towards irritation or anger, these emotional states or general confusion, anxiety, fear, um, these are patterns or perceptual patterns, sanya, uh, that kind of uh, form a, uh, our, uh, the color of our experience. These are conditioned from over many years and many lifetimes, uh, these patterns. So uh, we respond to the events uh, and to the vipaka uh, through these, these lenses of, of uh, sanya. And, and what arises uh, in the present moment also at the same time, uh, uh, kind of synchronically, if you will, are the, the feelings that are associated with these perceptions, these patterns, uh, the experiences of pleasant and unpleasant. So these arise in the moment, um, and we don't have a huge amount of control over uh, that result, that resultant experience. Uh, we have to experience the effects in some way or another. But what we can do is, uh, in the present moment, is uh, alter, we do have some control over that ability to uh, experience them in different ways. If, uh, if our minds are fuzzy and cleared and still under the influence of these um, perceptual patterns or these underlying tendencies, uh, then we might just react in the same old way that we always have or that we tend to do and just create more programming that reinforces the same old patterns. So, you know, something unpleasant or difficult comes into our life, we respond with anger, uh, we s act on it, we say something, we do something, uh, even think something, um, and then it just uh, sets in motion a whole new wave uh, sankara, a whole new push uh, into uh, reinforcing that same mental pattern. And this is you know, how we often live our lives. We do have the opportunity, though, with mindfulness and clear comprehension, uh, to see as these uh, experiences arise uh, and before we jump into um, reactivity you know, based on the same old tendencies and patterns, we have the ability to wake up in, that, in this moment and say, hold on, don't want to do that. It, you know, I don't want to keep the cycle of pain going. 
and we have the ability to, and that right then and there, in that moment, in the present moment, changes our experience uh, for one of clouded delusion, grasping, uh, defensiveness, uh, same old, same old, uh, into one of clarity and uh, uh, a sense of uh, truthfulness when we can see it uh, and maybe prevent the, the, the habitual reaction to, from happening. So that affects our experience in the present moment, and it also uh, lays the ground for uh, the future. Uh, we uh, let go of a reaction, uh, or we uh, avoid a reaction that's going to create pain, and uh, if we're able to do that successfully, then that pain or that result that comes from uh, unskillful response won't happen. So that uh, skillful action in the present moment uh, leads to skillful result in, in the future. Uh, through the non-experiencing of a harmful habit or through the experiencing of a new, uh, a new karmically uh, potent way of looking, thing, looking at things like development of patience or development of kindness, uh, uh, then we re, you know, will receive the results of that in the future. So that's the synchronic and the linear aspects of, of, um, of kama and uh, vipaka. So we have some control. We don't have absolute control of what often comes our way, but we do have uh, uh, a modicum of control of how we respond and how we experience it in the present moment and laying the ground for the future. So um, it's important to know then what's going on in your mind when you're kind of uh, figuring out, you know, do I just be with this uh, and uh, experience uh, an inevitable result of some past way of being? Uh, do I just uh, you know, allow it and hold it? Or do I shift my attention uh, to something um, different, more skillful, um, if, uh, if I do have some control? Uh, so oftentimes we don't have where we need to be present and where we need to be uh, allowing uh, and uh, fully with an experience is when it's in that uh, manifesting phase of, of, uh, of an experience that's coming up from past action, a result of past action, a memory of something unskillful um, or some inexplicable, uh, difficult uh, uh, interaction that happened. Uh, and uh, before we act on, on it, uh, we, we be with it and we see if we can experience it fully just for what it is, even if it's painful. We see if there's some space we can find to, to hold that painful experience without adding into it, without jumping in and feeding it um, through unwise attention. And if we see that starting to well up and to emerge, then that's where we need to take that moment of ability to control how we are responding in the moment, use skillful attention, wise attention, to shift to uh, a mental state that's going to be more fruitful. Patience, kindness. Patience is the supreme one, of course, uh, where these mental states can kind of be and then pass away. So that's a skillful use of the ability to control uh, where we put our minds. So there's, um, you know, different ways that um, uh, experience comes to us, physical experience like illness. Um, you know, a, a good uh, experiment or a good uh, tool for contemplation is when our body is physically ill. What, you know, where do we go with that? How do we respond to that? You know, everybody experiences illness at some time or another. And uh, where do our minds go? Do, the, uh, do we um, hold it personally, feel like it shouldn't be this way? This is a, you know, these viruses or these bacteria or this 
you know, organ that isn't working correctly or this system that isn't working correct, uh, uh, correctly shouldn't be this way. You know, this is kind of, this is foreign to uh, my body. It shouldn't be here. Uh, these uh, invaders shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be here. It, this is my body. You know, even if we don't say that in our minds, we, we, you know, we think that uh, or experience uh, that we, we should have some control uh, over uh, these things that happen to human bodies. And we do have, of course, the ability to seek help and get treatment uh, to some extent. But uh, what's the mind state that goes along with that? And if it doesn't work, what's the mind state that goes along with that? Uh, and have to tease out where it is that we have control and where it is that we don't have control. And where we don't have control always is that cancer that arises. You know, we don't know where that came from. Is it just biology? Is there some karmic connection? Who knows? Um, or, you know, the invading flu bug, the, the virus, you know, it doesn't belong in me. I need to get rid of it. Well, they don't know that. The, the viruses and the bacteria, they, you know, they're just operating according to their laws of biology, you know, as far as they're concerned, that your body is their body. So how do we hold uh, this sense of self uh, and ownership and what we think is control uh, when we get ill. Well, we do what we can reasonably do, and, um, but then we don't get, you know, skillful, if we, if we react skillfully, we don't get, you know, to twist it up if, if it's not working. We might try something else, but, you know, we also realize that um, we don't have an ultimate control over, over what happens. This body has its own nature, it has its own course, um, and it'll do, eventually it'll do what it'll do. Uh, one of the uh, memories that comes up was, you know, the very the quintessential, uh, skillful, in a sense skillful response, although uh, <laughs> maybe a little bit uh, too extreme in, in that direction was the, the story of when uh, Lumpur Liam had his uh, heart issues uh, starting to well up. And, uh, and he waited until uh, it got quite bad, I guess, to, to mention it or to seek any help, uh, mention it to other people. And it wasn't until his heart was functioning at about, I think it was about 20% or, or so, that uh, he ended up getting medical help. And uh, after things, after the treatments started uh, having their effect, and he, he he was getting better, you know, I think some, if I get the story right, you know, someone asked him, you know, why didn't you seek help sooner? You know, why didn't you, you know, before it got to this point? And his response was something along the lines of, well, I just thought this is what bodies do. <laughs> so, you know, his equanimity. Uh, was so strong, you know, this is, well, this is just what bodies do. Um, I guess most of us probably would have uh, seeked help a little bit sooner than that, but uh, we can all aspire for that level of, of equanimity in response to um, what it is that we don't have a huge amount of control over. And in the end, nature will run its course. I don't know if there's anybody alive now that was alive 150 years ago. So. It's, uh, the body does what the body does. But we can control, what we do have control over is how we experience uh, our bodies uh, and what we think of them and how we respond to them and what we make of them and how much we th control we think we have. The m mental patterns are a bit trickier. Uh, body's pretty straightforward. Uh, mental patterns are, are a bit trickier to kind of tease out what we have control over and what we don't have control over. It can be, it can be confusing. You know, when negative mental patterns uh, are experienced, it's just like, okay, well, is this just a, a mental pattern that is kind of a conditioned personality? Uh, 
part of my personality or is this a reaction uh, that uh, I could have some, I could modify in some way. Uh, and it gets a little bit more nuanced uh, when you're looking at mental patterns like that. Uh, and when to just sort of say, oh, well, this is part of who I am and experience it and accept it. Or, gee, maybe I can change that. Or maybe I can let go of that and choose a mental pattern that's a little bit more skillful. And that just takes uh, experience uh, and a willingness to explore different ways of responding uh, to those mental patterns. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, you know, we do have these, these perceptual patterns and these experiences that are strongly ingrained in us, like we might have a tendency towards, say, dosa, angry irritation, that's ingrained. Um, and then uh, we reach the point where we're experiencing a, a mental state like that. And the, the, the goal is to be able to see it as clearly and as quickly as possible so that we don't uh, compound it. Compounding is, is another one of those words that's uh, used in reference to uh, the word sankara, volitional action, intentional action. It's when we rise up, when, when that sense of uh, movement in the mind rises up and starts to compound uh, a simple experience, layer on, add layers onto it. And that's what we don't need to do. We don't have to do that. You know, there's so many different patterns that we can get into. It's easy to get into. And, and oftentimes, you know, if, we've, if there's an external source or an external stimulation, like an event or a situation that occurs or a particular person that triggers, you know, certain mental patterns, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes the the response is to try and annihilate, just like the uh, parents of those two teenagers. They wanted to just annihilate the cause uh, that would take care of it. So we try and isolate ourselves from, uh, you know, unpleasant, difficult circumstances or unpleasant, difficult people. You know, we try and banish them to the basement. You know, get you know, to, so that we just don't have to to be with the people or the circumstances that cause that rise up to give us, uh, us you know, the reinforce our negativities or our unhappiness or unpleasantness or our instability or self-doubt or whatever. Um, and, you know, that works sometimes to a certain extent, but it doesn't change the response pattern inside. Uh, we certainly don't want to surround ourselves with unskillful people uh, are difficult, you know, when there are certain unskillful situations or people who are acting really unskillfully and it causes these difficult mind states. We don't need to invite that in. We don't need to associate with that unskillfulness. But, um, you know, uh, in some situations it's, it's useful not to, not to turn away, but to, uh, just be there and uh, allow oneself to kind of um, experience the unpleasantness uh, just as it is. You know, try not to buy into the story, buy into the to the habit, uh, to the scenario, the uh, the proliferation. Uh, try not to let it go there. That's where we can turn our attention away from the story. But to try and see if one can be with unpleasant feeling. You know, what is it like? Can I be with this? Can I bear it? Can I identify it in a particular place in my body and just kind of hang in there with it without adding to it, without trying to annihilate the cause? And if we can do that, 
we often learn that it doesn't have so much potency as, as, uh, as we're led to believe. Or sometimes we, you know, when those mind states come up, we, we blame ourselves. You know, we're not blaming uh, an external situation or an uh, external being. You know, we turn it inwards and get into um, self-criticism. I shouldn't be this way. I shouldn't react this way. Uh, and uh, there I go again. Uh, why can't I learn just to be more patient? Why can't I learn not to be so upset? Um, so it's the same kind of motion of mind. It's just the object is one that's internal, self-directed rather than external. And then there's all the external circumstances that can come our way in terms of the, the worldly dhammas, like you know, praise and blame and uh, how people view us for, uh, for better or for worse reputation. Um, and trying to control those, yeah. and that's even, you know, that's even crazier to try and control. You know, we, we have some modicum of control over our internal response, but to try and control the outside world, even if we're we don't feel like we've been involved. You know, sometimes people will criticize us for what seem like pretty crazy reasons. You know, that are based on their own issues and don't really have anything to do with us. And you know that happens. That this is this is the way of the world. Uh, you know, there's that Dhammapada phrase uh, or teaching that I'm probably completely mistranslating or mis, uh, misquoting, but something along the lines of of uh, uh, some people uh, talk too much and they get criticized. Some people talk too little and they get criticized. Some people talk just the right amount, and they get criticized, too. Everybody's criticized. So it's just criticism. Receiving criticism is part of living uh, with, uh, in a world with, with other people. So trying to control that, uh, or reacting to that, uh, and feeling that it's unfair, or it shouldn't be, is just banging your head against a wall. It's, it's just going to happen or how people view us, you know, how we want people to view us in a good way, and people view us in a way that's uh, unfair or wrong. Um, uh, or if we're doing that to other people, you know, the, the painfulness and resisting that, and uh, painfulness engaging in that, and, and, uh, and how, uh, you know, we can't prevent that from happening to us. Uh, we can maybe learn how to prevent doing it to other people as we see the, the difficulties and pain that it causes. So there's control and no control over uh, many of the things that happen in our mental world. You know, good to know what it is that we just have to be with and what it is that we can, uh, what we can tweak and influence. The word uh, responsibility kind of comes to my mind. Um, and oftentimes when we hear you know, people tell us or we think or we tell ourselves, oh, I need to take responsibility or I need to be responsible for my own uh, actions, uh, my own response, you know, patterns. I need, uh, you know, you need to take responsibility. You know, you're the only one that can, you know, make the change for yourself. Um, you know, you need to be responsible for your actions, for the way you respond. Uh, and, and there's, of course, a conventional truth to that. Um, but it's important, I think, there's a nuance in there that uh, implies a certain uh, paradigm of control, again, of, of someone, you, me, uh, being... Uh, uh, you, you should take responsibility. There's kind of an imperative there that has a real strong sense of self or ownership. Uh, and again, in a conventional way, there's a, 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 an element of truth to that. But I once heard it described, and I always like this, that you know, when you uh, uh, taking responsibility or assuming responsibility for something means 
having the ability to respond. Responsibility is having the ability to respond skillfully. Um, and it kind of takes that personal edge out of it, of like, you know, it's your fault kind of uh, aspect of, of take responsibility to more like, oh, I have the ability to respond to this in a skillful way. Or I, need, or I can develop the ability to respond. This is responsibility. And you know, realizing that um, there is that level of control in the moment. We have the ability to respond in a skillful way. We just need to train ourselves and be aware. You know, because we're not going to, um, we're not going to liberate our personality. I've heard you know, several of our teachers say that over the time. You know, it's sort of like the personality isn't what gets liberated. Um, we've got a certain number of tendencies uh, that uh, are just kind of in, you know, part of the character in a way. It's like the uh, the stories that have been uh, recounted in. A few talks and a few reflections, readings of, of uh, Ajahn Mahabua um, and uh, George Sharp confronting him with, you know, why are you so rude? And uh, Ajahn Mahabua's response of just laughing, saying, ah, oh, it's just, you know, it's just personality character. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're not, we're not looking to, uh, we're not looking for 100% psychological perfection. We, you know, we're not going to ever kind of undo all of our uh, particular character traits uh, and become, you know, these perfect people. <laughs> you know, thank goodness we don't have to do that. It's, uh, you know, it's okay to have a few neuroses every now and then. It's like, you know, get, get uh, comfortable with your... Your, your neurotic habits, if you, you know, rather than trying to neurotically fix every single thing and be a certain way. But learning not to believe them, not to take them seriously, not to take them as who you are, and not to act on the unskillful ones um, or the ones that could lead to uh, harmfulness. For ourselves or for others, it's like a, the the palm reader who was reading Ajahn Chah's palm uh, and said, "Oh wow, uh, Ajahn and Paul, you have a lot of anger. I can see that in your in your palm. You have a lot of anger." And his response of, "Yes, but I don't use it. So he doesn't pick it up. One doesn't pick it up. One might see a certain wave or a tendency towards a certain character trait." Uh, coursing through one's mind in a, in a particular situation, but it's seen uh, as it arises, and it's not picked up. Uh, it's not taken hold of. It's not grasped or clung to or acted on. It just arises, passes away. It's a characteristic, you know, a pattern without any real substance. So, you know, that's the goal, I think, for us, is to learn to see those patterns and not buy into them, not believe them, not identify with them, not act on them. But you don't annihilate them. So the tools that are really useful, I think, you know, tools that we hear about developing all the time, um, you know, developing a lot of uh, spaciousness in the mind uh, so that when the unpleasant patterns emerge, um, they're given their space. They're not, uh, we're not rushing to avoid, rushing to bury, rushing to annihilate, rushing to get away from. Uh, we see the, the patterns as they arise and uh, with the space of patience, with the space of kindness towards those mental states themselves. And then we look at them with clarity, mindfulness and clear comprehension. Um, Buddha talks about clear comprehension as knowing 
A perception as it arises, persists, passes away. Knowing a feeling as it arises, persists, passes away. Knowing a thought as it arises, persists and passes away. This is clear comprehension on the mental level. So creating the space of non-reactivity, of kindness, patience, and then seeing it clearly with wisdom uh, so that we can be with it but not uh, but not use it, not act on it in that way that Ajahn Chah describes. So those are the tools that we can develop to help us be, uh, respond uh, appropriately, uh, knowing when we have a bit of control and knowing when we don't. Uh, that's where it starts. So I think I'll leave it there for this evening and uh, call it a night. Um, no,